skill, their competence, um, and the competence of all those who've trained them and equipped them to undertake a very dangerous mission. No one here needs to be reminded of the responsibility that we have to provide weapon systems to young men and women to serve them well on the worst days. But it has been a long time since the Navy was presented with such a vivid illustration of this priority. This generation of senior flag officers knows that the difference between a successful campaign and a travesty can be as small as one or two missiles. Today in the Red Sea where our warfighters are operating within reach of threat systems every day, those one or two missiles, one or two drones, or one or two USVs are out there waiting for our people and for our systems to slip up. And no one in this room would deny the difficult trade-offs between cost, schedule, and performance that our requirements officers and program managers work through every single day. But the Red Sea has to remind us all how well we balance those trade-offs ends up being measured in very concrete ways in times of crisis. For months now in the Red Sea, we've been in a position where we have to succeed 100% of the time. Not 99, not 98, with our sailors, many from Virginia in harm's way, those connected to the enterprise and, and others in that strike group in harm's way, we have to succeed 100% of the time. A weapon system that delivers too late, or it's too expensive to afford, or not mission capable when it needs to be, is not doing anything for sailors or Marines as they go into harm's way. And getting these trade-offs wrong will also consume taxpayer dollars that could buy real-time capability elsewhere. I don't say any of this as a critique. I just think we've been blessed with a very impressive, dedicated individuals in your positions over the past several years, but we're seeing in real time the consequences of decisions that have been made for, for decades that are now um, being relied upon to keep our folks safe. Despite the best efforts of all predecessors, we've watched as the performance of Navy shipbuilding has slowly declined. And this is something I know we're going to talk a lot about today. And we know that the pacing threat for the Navy and Marine Corps is even more stressing, ultimately, than the challenge that we face in the Red Sea. The Navy's list of headlines is familiar to everyone in this room. The use of the term once in a generation investment has become all too frequent in these settings, must pay bills to modernize the nation's strategic to turn and rebuild the infrastructure for nuclear vessel maintenance are coming due as we come to grips with the consequences of losing an entire generation of skilled shipbuilders to retirement during the pandemic. Flagship programs like the Columbia struggle despite consistent prioritization and secondary, but just as vital, programs are floundering, too. There are success stories. Um, people are great success stories. The amphibious warship and destroy production are both moving forward apace, but even these programs face pretty severe workforce shortages. As the saying goes, the first step is admitting we have a challenge, admitting we have a problem. So thank you, Secretary Girton, and please pass my thanks to Secretary Del Toro for starting a hard conversation about the state of Navy shipbuilding with your 45-day review. I hope we can continue that conversation here and during the entire NDA process and do what we can to make this problem better. There are certainly areas where we're going to need to make big, painful investments to preserve our capacity to build warships for the generations to come. But there are also areas where money is not going to make a difference, or at least not make enough of a difference, fast enough to be worth the investment. And today I want to hear about how we're being intentional about those trades and the opportunity costs that go with them. Um, in particular, we had a readiness subcommittee hearing earlier today, and we talked an awful lot about the workforce. We talked about recruiting into the uniformed service, but we talked about the workforce in our industrial base. And my belief, and I think I'm on the HELP Committee, so I focus a lot on education and workforce issues, is an awful lot of the challenge that we're seeing is a workforce challenge. And we sometimes say another part of the challenge is the supply chain challenge, but that's a workforce challenge too, because an awful lot of our supply chain backups are driven by our um, industrial partners having the same workforce challenges, attracting and retaining good talent as we see in the military and on our prime contractors. General Huckle, I want to finish and just say a word about you. This is your last hearing in front of the subcommittee, unless there is some 
emergency that crops up in the next couple of days that causes us to have another one. And I want to make a particular point of thanking you. Since you took this job, you, you've given very candid, frank testimony in front of this committee in the midst of the most consequential reorganization of the Marine Corps in recent memory. You've been open with us. You've been willing to tell us what you think we need to hear, even if it's maybe not what we want to hear, or even if you know you might face some disagreement from some on this committee. I hope to discuss force design a little bit today, as we have many times before, but I also want to applaud the sense of urgency and professionalism with which General Berger, General Smith, yourself, and many other fine Marines have approached these efforts. You remind us of why America wants a Marine Corps. And as you head into a well-deserved retirement, you've earned thanks from a grateful Corps, a grateful Congress, and a grateful nation. And with that, now let me yield to my colleague, Senator Kramer, for his opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and great to be um, your partner. Um, as the Chairman alluded to, we're not both from coastal states, but together we know a lot about the seas and the prairies. Um, but that said, uh, thank you to all of our witnesses. And I, I might as well start where the Chairman ended, uh, General Heckel, and, and thank you for your service. Congratulate you on, on your retirement. And I'm sure you could find another role that would allow you to come and testify before Congress, since I'm sure that's one of your favorite things that, that you'll miss the most in your job. But anyway, thank you. Um, and and, and uh, to that point, to the point about um, your directness, your bluntness, that is something that we appreciate very much on this committee. As I've mentioned to others as well, Admiral, we look forward to hearing from you. And, and Mr. Secretary, I appreciated our, our discussion earlier this week. Um, but it, but. The plain truth is something we all need to, to hear and share with each other from time to time. Realizing that the political constraints we work in, um, we're also in a, in a, you know, we're in a dangerous world right now and we need to know what's necessary and what's doable and you need to tell us what you need from us. And uh, I appreciate all of you being here today and look forward to, uh, to working with you. Uh, the importance of sea power is obviously um, only going to increase uh, over the years and it's pretty darn important right now. Uh, our Navy thwarts Houthi drone and missile attacks on a daily basis. Our Marine Corps campaigns in the Western Pacific with allies and partners to deter the aggression of the Chinese Communist Party. I, along with every other Republican Senate Armed Services member, expressed serious concerns with President Biden's order to build a temporary pier on the Gaza coast because of the serious risk to U.S. personnel. And unfortunately, as predicted, they came under mortar fire from Hamas terrorists just last week, which demonstrates the importance of contested logistics. No other nation can match the capabilities of our great Navy and Marine Corps, but there is always room for improvement, and we want to talk about that and be a part of that. Our sea lift and logistical capabilities are in need of attention. While the Navy partially owns these responsibilities, sea lift moves more than 90% of military equipment and supplies. We simply do not have adequate capacity. For example, one large ship en route to Gaza turned around due to an engine room fire, creating an indefinite delay. If we struggle to build a temporary pier in the Mediterranean, how will we build them in the hundreds in the Pacific? During World War II, the Navy's famed Seabees built over 400 advanced bases. I also expect that the Navy will improve its support to the Marine Corps as they pivot back to their traditional naval and expeditionary formations. Amphibious ships are in a deplorable state of readiness. Only one amphibious ship out of three was ready to participate in this year's international exercise, Cobra Gold. Additionally, chronic instability of amphibious ship procurement puts the industrial base at great risk. A multi-ship buy of amphibious ships is desperately needed. Instability in shipbuilding is not limited to amphibious ships, as you know. Forecasted shipbuilding plans have seen massive variation from year to year. The difference between high and low procurement estimates, um, estimates procurement in a fiscal year has averaged six ships over the past decade. The December 2020 shipbuilding plan forecasted the procurement of 19 ships in fiscal year 2025, but here we are discussing the 2025 budget that requests just six. A difference of 13 battle force ships. Industry investments, which take five to 10 years to materialize, require stability in shipbuilding orders. We need to send the right market signals and the right demand signals. I'm also concerned with progress towards the unmanned fleet. 
The Navy wants to jump into large unmanned vessels while largely ignoring the transition of small and medium systems that can be deployed to the fleet much sooner. For example, the Navy never planned to transition the small unmanned surface vessel program. It has been thrust upon them from the outside. We must learn, experiment, and scale these emerging technologies ahead of our adversaries. The United States enjoys the most innovative commercial and startup ecosystem in the world, and we must harness this advantage for national security. Thank all, again all of our witnesses and look forward to the testimony. We needn't uh, have introductions since we know you really well. So maybe I'll start with Secretary Girton and then ask Admiral Pitts and General Hackle to testify, and then we'll open up five minute rounds of questions. Thank you, Chairman Kane and Ranking Member Kramer and distinguished members of the subcommittee. On behalf of myself, Vice Admiral Pitts and Lieutenant General Heckel, uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and address the Department of Navy's fiscal year 2025 budget um, for sea power capabilities. We'd like to thank this subcommittee for your leadership and support in shipbuilding, naval aviation, and ground programs, and to maintain maritime superiority in defense of our nation. Uh, thank you also for mentioning the sailors and Marines operating around the world. As the action over the recent weeks have shown, support for our allies remains resilient on a superior naval force, strategically postured to adapt to cons consistently evolving geopolitical challenges and threats. The sailors of the Eisenhower, the Arleigh Burke, the Kearney, and others have the watch to defend against the Iranian Houthi aggression that includes engaging and destroying more than 80 one-way attack UAVs and at least six ballistic missiles intended to strike Israel from Iran and Yemen. We are grateful for the professionalism and skill of our sailors and Marines and mindful of the sacrifices of their families at home. The investments that Congress made in previous budgets enabled our success. I also want to express the Department's gratitude at the passage of the Security Supplemental to make additional investments in submarine industrial base while supporting our allies and partners. As we look forward to 2025, the actions of the Navy and Marine Corps team reassures international allies and partners deters potential adversaries in response to those who threaten the lives of our sailors, Marines, and civilian merchant mariners engaged in lawful international commercial activities. The Navy remains focused on the pacing challenge of managing strategic competition with the People's Republic of China, Russia's illegal war of invasion of Ukraine, the Houthi strikes in the Red Sea, and Iranian aggression of our allies. The President's fiscal year 2025 budget provides the resources necessary for the Navy and Marine Corps to continue to implement the 2022 National Defense Strategy. This request builds and sustains the right mix of capabilities to keep the seas open and free, deter conflict, and defend against current and future threats. In alignment with the Secretary of the Navy's priorities, the budget request enables a one Navy Marine Corps team to continue to strengthen our maritime dominance, building on our culture of warfighting excellence, and enhancing strategic partnerships. Thank you for the opportunity to be appear before your subcommittee today. Our mission begins and ends with providing the best possible capabilities to our sailors and Marines in the fleet, and the three of us look forward to answering your questions. Admiral Pitts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Girton covered the opening statement for the, all three of us, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, our discussion this Great. afternoon and any questions. Same, General Huckle? Yes, sir. Okay, well, we'll jump in. So let me say that it's not going to come as a surprise. The, the first question I'm going to ask is about the submarine industrial base and the one submarine request that came over this year. We've made a commitment not only to try to build two a year for us, but we made a commitment to build Virginia-class subs for the Aussies to be able to sell to them in the 2030s. And it's a commitment that's not just words. The Aussies have made a major investment in our workforce to enable this to happen. Imagine, to my colleagues, if we were having a floor debate on the Senate floor about investing $3 billion in the Australian workforce or the Korean workforce, that would not be an easy debate. And so the Aussies have done a pretty heavy lift politically to make this investment. And I've had conversations with them, and, and they're a little bit confused about the signal sent by the one Virginia-class sub. We know how vital this is, the Virginia-class sub, and we've been alarmed by the 45-day report, but other indicia of real problems in, the, in that program over the last few years. And a lot of it is on the workforce. We talk a lot about the workforce and supply chain development, and it seems like we talk about it a lot 
try to push the boulder up the hill but only make incremental advances. Earlier in the readiness hearing, Senator Blumenthal was saying, we need to see kind of a great leap forward on this, and we're not really seeing it. With this one submarine request, there's a real risk, I believe, that progress we've made on building up capacity across the supplier base could be at risk. So, Secretary Girton, let me start with you. What's the impact of procuring only a single Virginia-class sub in fiscal year 2025 on our ability to meet our own needs, but also on our ability to meet the commitment that we've made on this really important AUKUS framework? Senator, the, the resources we got in the supplemental, especially related to the submarine industrial base, are part of that clear message we're sending to is, is your mic on, Secretary Gordon? Uh, maybe I it need is? to okay. lean a little bit more forward. Okay, great. Um, so the submarine industrial base funding is critical to making sure that we can build the capacity that we need to uh, build up to not just two Virginias a year, but really two and a third, so that we could satisfy the needs of our Australian um, teammates. Um, in terms of uh, the uh, the industrial base capacity, uh, we have a lot of submarines on order, uh, but we've also added um, additional resources for advanced procurement that will help smooth out those differences. Anything you'd like to add, General uh, Admiral? No, sir. Let me ask this just to follow up. If, if workforce is a significant component of these delays, and we've known it for a while, and some of these industrial investments that we're making are to build a workforce, what, what are you seeing in kind of early returns, uh, you know, uh, priorities, projects, initiatives that are showing some signs of success that might give the committee confidence that we, we'll get to where we need to with respect to these programs? We've had some tremendous success in not only getting the message out that the Navy is hiring, not the Navy, but also industry. Uh, the industry we need to build, say, submarines, but also other parts of the Navy as well. So we are seeing um, some definite improvement in the hiring rates in industry, but also uh, the training that we're uh, working with industry, with organizations um, um, in Virginia, in New England, and other places to improve the breadth of people we have available to do this waterfront tradecraft work, as well as the engineers and logisticians and other people in support of that, the work. And Mr. Secretary, based on the conversation we had yesterday, just to share with the committee, I, I find it interesting that you talk about the greening of the workforce in the ship and subspace. Many of our workforces in the country have a graying workforce where huge percentages are within five years of retirement. That has its own set of challenges. The greening of the workforce could be a good thing down the road if we can convince people to stay, but it also creates some significant challenges in production capacity now. Could you talk about that a little bit? Thank you, yes. So as, um, as the challenges of COVID made themselves manifest, we found a lot of the uh, production work that was going on was being done by seasoned veterans who really knew their craft, needed very little supervision. But as they were retirement eligible and the challenges of working in a close proximity environment, I mean, you can't do shipbuilding over teams. Um, they retired. And we were able to hire in new people, but they required more supervision. Their first time quality wasn't as high. So that caused some challenges with some of our marquee programs. And unfortunately, it was um, uh, where we are with, say, Columbia is it probably wasn't going to get any better than where we are. Now, some of our other ship programs, we certainly are engaging with industry to improve and happy to be transparent with you about the work we're doing in that area. Um, I'm going to stick to my five minutes and now yield to Senator Kramer. I, I will have more questions in a second round once others are done, Senator. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, on that point, Secretary Girton, uh, about, I call it the, the re reverse um, hockey stick, the, the acceleration of a project w w you know, with multiple experiences throughout it. Um, and I think Tim really hit the point. At this point, we're, we're starting with some, you know, some fresh workforce, but what's the, what do we have to do differently to make sure that that fresh workforce turns gray while still building ships, or at least stays with long enough to, to get up to the speed of, of the adversaries? The investments we're making in training and um, improving that capacity has to be met with investments with industry so that we can work on this problem together. 
Um, we'll do what we can to help them, but it's their business. And they're already uh, appreciating some of the challenges with not being able to deliver in terms of the timing associated with their incentives, right? If they're you know, behind on schedule, they're missing out on profit. So th this is our problem together, and we're gonna work it with industry, but um, we, what we found is that getting people out to the waterfront or in these places where it's physical labor, it's interesting, and it's something you can build a career out of. There's ways of advancing in terms of going in as an apprentice and then becoming a journeyman and then a supervisor. These are great jobs for doing great work for the, this great nation. Um, what we're finding, though, is if we can hang on to them for three years, they're in it for the long term, but we're really learning and we're helping industry figure this out together, is how do we get them to that third year mm -hmm. so they'll stay for the long haul? Yeah, well, that's you know, a great point. And, um, you know, when you, when you can get a workforce that works for mission as well as money, um, that, that's, I think, a part of the secret sauce. And um, just let us know what we can do. Now, along those same lines, um, I, I, I think we discussed this the other day. Um, I, I was recently um, in San Diego and in, in, in L.A. Um, I visited NASCO, as a matter of fact, and, and learned a lot about some of the things you're talking about right now. But I also visited the Air Force's Collaborative Combat Aircraft um, a couple of the, the programs that, and was, I don't mind telling you, a, a little bit excited about the recent awarding of, of what I would consider of the five companies that um, were competing to move forward, the two biggest disruptors were chosen in Andrel and, and General Atomics. And there, there are other examples um, um, of, of how we've you know, sort of expanded our industrial base. Uh, the Army selected uh, Palantir for its Titan program. Um, you know, obviously, Space Force, which is new, is is only really successful because of some disruptors in industry that sort of kept space alive. SpaceX, eSpace, e and a newer entrance into it, things, Rocket Labs. Um, so, so clearly, the fleet's done a, a good job of experimenting. In fact, I think the Navy has the best research and development lab in in the in the military. But can you describe any major Navy programs, um, not just prototypes that have been awarded, sort of innovative or non-traditional contracts or, or, or companies that have been able to get in the biz, if you will, um, and, and show some real innovation? Um, we've done some amazing innovations in the area of unmanned surface and undersea mm. vessels. So I'll let um, Admiral Pitts talk about that. I did want to talk about how uh, the Navy's effort in kind of larger uh, collaborative aircraft, the MQ-25 mm -hmm. uh, refueling oh, aircraft, and we're making great progress. A little bit of a stumble to get that started, but uh, Boeing is doing some important work in getting that aircraft through its testing so we can get into production. So we need that refueling jet in a big way. Uh, Admiral? Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, for innovation and, and getting things out much quicker, uh, we have had some recent uh, success in that we stood up in the Navy a disruptive capabilities office to, to take emerging operational problems from our fleet commanders, swarm it, work with industry, work with all the experts on the, on the uh, appropriate experts on the OPNAV staff to include contracting and acquisition and see if we can deliver a, uh, a very fast solution and capability to our fleet commanders. And we're working hand in hand with OSD's replicator effort, which is scaling some of those mass, smaller, unmanned systems to meet operational challenges. And uh, during, in that, we're introducing some, some newer companies and different companies that are showing innovation at scale, sir. Well, not wanting to offend the chairman in any way, since he kept to five minutes, I'll do the same for the first <laughs> round, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Senator King's up next. I have a reputation around here for being reasonable and calm. Today I'm not going to be. The budget for directed energy in the Department of Defense has fallen by 50% in the last two years. We are spending $4 million to shoot down a $20,000 drone from, from uh, the Houthis. What in the hell are you guys thinking? The Navy directed energy budget has gone practically to nothing. I don't get it. We're in a world of drones and low-cost missiles and low-cost drones, and this is the technology that can do something about this, and you're cutting the budget in half. 
this ought to be the highest priority. You ought to be doubling and tripling the budget, not cutting it in half. Can you give me any rational reason for not pursuing this critical technology as we move into a time of swarming drones? I mean, we can't shoot swarming drones down with missiles. Come on. Any, any answer to this? So the, I'm only getting um, started, by the way. I've got another one coming. <laughs> but I, I, seriously, th this is, I've been beating this drum for three or four years. I'm getting nowhere, and we're getting creamed. And we've got, uh, we're getting creamed in the Red Sea. We're getting, the, the, the Ukrainians are getting creamed with, with cheap drones coming in from Iran. And we're cutting the damn budget for the technology that could save us. The warfighters out in the fleet are using the tools they have to do the work they yeah, need. Yeah, but we're not giving them the company. tools. Well, uh, we're giving them tools that have been successful, but perhaps are on the wrong side of the cost curve. So um, I agree with you completely. The opportunity to invest in directed energy is uh, all around us. Uh, however, it has to work. We have an experiment uh, prototype put on a uh, one destroyer. Well, you have Helios, Helios out in the yep. out in, in San Diego. I don't know right. why we're not testing Helios in the Red Sea, but that's another question. Uh, it's, we we have one unit. But the on point that is, budget. budgets are policy, and your policy is we don't give a damn about directed energy. That's what the policy is in this budget, and and I I don't I mean I understand you got to make choices and everything else, but to me this is an obvious choice. It's like telling a a soldier on the battlefield you can't have a rifle. This is the technology of the 21st century, particularly for uh, aerial warfare. Um, I'm excited Everyone about... Wanna take a crack at that? Yeah, go ahead. Wouldn't you like to yeah. have directed energy on those destroyers? Yeah, thank you, Senator. Uh, yes, sir, we would. And we would. Uh, we are continuing efforts, and I, I, it is an absolute valid point that uh, our budget was... Re we reduced our budget in, in this particular area of directed energy. It yeah, was from part of that risk million, The Navy allocation. reduced from 152 million to 82 million at right. a time when the demand is going up. That just, I cannot make that make sense. Yes, sir. But we are continuing efforts, uh, not as fast as we would like, in both lasers, as Helios is one example, and then working with OSD and the Joint Force on a higher energy laser, right. land based. Microwaves. And high powered microwaves. Yes, sir. Well, uh, again, it's fine for you to tell me that, but the budget is what's talking here, and it's not talking very loudly about this essential need. Okay, second issue that's really bothering me, and that is uh, readiness. You, there's an, a, an attachment on the Navy website that talks about ships underway, and there are th 294 ships deployable. There are 70 that are on a that are underway. We have 12 aircraft carriers, four are underway. In other words, about 75% of the ships that we have aren't doing anything. What the hell's that all about? What, what, and by the way, I did a little research today in the, in the Carnival Cruise Line, and I know there are differences, but 90% of their ships are available all the time. And their average time in dry dock is, is about eight weeks. And those are complex ships. Those are like cities with 5,000 uh, cabins and heat and water and light and everything else. I'm not saying they're comparable, but it's a damn sight different between 90% availability and 25% and, uh, and availability. And you, you well know as well as I do, a ship goes into one of our maintenance facilities and it's, and it's, it's there. Uh, what can we do about that? We're appropriating a lot of money to build these ships. You're not using them. Senator, an excellent point. When I uh, went through my confirmation hearing, I promised you and the rest of your colleagues that I would get out to these shipyards, I would see what's going on, and I would find out how to improve the way we not only build them, but also the way we maintain them. And I have been true to my word on that, and I've been getting out to these shipyards, and we are working on improving how we do that If you work. need more money for more infrastructure for maintenance, tell us. But, you know, we're spending a lot of money building ships that, that are sitting sitting somewhere that aren't, aren't being used, a 25% utilization rate. If, if you were a, a, an airline, by the way, the numbers are similar for the airlines. They're about 90% available at all times. Uh, they'd be out of business. I mean, the difference is they have to make a profit. And I just hope you'll look at it that way and think about a better utilization of the taxpayer's assets. When we spend $12 billion for an aircraft carrier, 
it ought to be out in the ocean. And then the final point, and I'm out of time, is hypersonics. As near as I can tell, we have no defense against hypersonics, which renders our entire Pacific fleet vulnerable in the first hour of a conflict. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator King. Senator Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, gentlemen, thank you. I'm, I'm, we had a readiness subcommittee hearing uh, with the vice uh, chiefs uh, just about an hour ago. So I'm going to repeat some of the questions, but I'm going to follow up on Senator King's question, Mr. Secretary and Admiral. Um, I asked the, the vice CNO uh, in, in the hearing we just had. So assume you have a magic wand, right? Meaning you can get done whatever you think you can get done. The knuckleheads in Congress aren't in the way. The President of the United States, who my view keeps putting forward budgets that don't reflect at all the sense of urgency and national security challenges, uh, those aren't limits. If you guys, in terms of our shipbuilding, we didn't talk about amphibs, 32% of the amphib fleet is ready. 32%. Holy cow. Like, Marine Corps can't deploy. Um, the boxer, you know, the big deck uh, uh, amphib that was supposed to go out with one of the mews just turned around because it screw doesn't work. I mean, it's a disaster. I think the Navy is in a ship building crisis. And I think the leadership from the secretary on down is responsible. Secretary of the Navy often because all oh, those big um, you know, defense contractors, they're plussing up their stock. I saw that was one of his quotes. He gets us his climate action plan 18 months ago. There's no statutory requirement, by the way, for the Secretary of Navy to give us a climate action plan. But a shipbuilding plan is in disarray. Disaster. So back to my question. Magic wand, no budget constraints. To Senator King's question, I think, I just met with a bunch of Republican senators on the Armed Services Committee this morning. We are, re we are ready. You want more shipyards? You want private shipyards? You want public shipyards? Because this is an existential challenge to the United States. Why? Because the Chinese are cranking out 10 to 12 high-end Navy ships a year. That's the challenge. So. For the two of you, what would be the top three things? Magic wand, anything you want. We will give you, and I actually think we're close enough, all of us, to do that. What do you need? We're America. We can build ships faster than the goddamn Chinese Communist Party. But right now, we're not. And they're eating our lunch. And if we go to war with them in the Taiwan Strait, it could be really ugly. What do you need, Mr. Secretary, Admiral? What? What the hell do you need? So I, I, I probably am not well advised to take you up on your offer. Why not? I would have to Are tell you in you, charge of this? The biggest thing that we could use, honestly, is more capacity for repair and construction. Okay, so what does that mean? Do you, that need, means, um, we you need, need another shipyard? Public, private? Honestly, we could use more shipyards. Okay. That would be an amazing place to end up. But China has been investing for 30 years on their ship repair, ship construction activities. And, and they are captured, I think, half of the commercial shipbuilding market right now. That means that we, um, as America, would need to value commercial shipbuilding as highly as they have in order to beat them at that game. Well, I, I, your testimony is a little depressing. We can beat China at the game, right? Look at our history. We can do these things. We're America. We need leadership. We need ideas. Admiral, what's your idea? Magic wand. Uh, <clears throat> sir, I agree with Secretary Gurdon that uh, the additional capacity, if you look at our shipbuilding plan this year to achieve our 381 ships per our requirement from the BIFSAR, it relies on our current industry to achieving the capacity and delivering our ships on time and on budget, along with resources to sustain that large of a fleet. And the number one item would be capacity, whether that is through outsourcing, or through another yard. Can you guys just dig into the, the concept of capacity a little bit more? Like, what, dive deeper on that. What do you mean by that? And what, so, um, what can we provide you? 
Uh, the Maritime Statescraft Initiative that Secretary of the Navy uh, started talking about and has been working across other departments is a, a good place to start the conversation. And one of the things that we stepped away from in the 70s and 80s was valuing a commercial shipbuilding industry. So we, that, that's a policy thing that together, uh, Navy and Congress and Department of Transportation, I, it, my personal opinion is we need to go back and revisit valuing building commercial ships as a part of what makes America strong. Well, look, I'm, uh, I'm going to wrap up here, Mr. Chairman, but um, whatever you guys think, give us your big ideas, maybe for the record, go back, you know, noodle on this a little bit. This is your job. This is your opportunity. You know, the history of our country is very promising in this regard. My team and I were looking at 1937 to December 6, 1941. A lot of people think we start building ships after Pearl Harbor, which we did. We actually almost tripled the size of the U.S. Navy before Pearl Harbor. So we can do this. It was Congress and it was the Navy. And so we can do this. We just need help and direction. But I think you have a bipartisan motivation, given the threat, to get on it. We just need big ideas, bold ideas. And... I certainly am one who would vote for them. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to follow up on a couple of the questions that have been asked so far. And Secretary Gerton, you and I talked a little bit about this issue when we were together in Groton recently. Um, I understand that there is an internal report that shows some of the, the delays for example, the Columbia, I believe, is more than a year behind schedule. Is that correct? Uh, uh, year and 16 and what, is, what is the uh, Virginia class construction delay look like? Uh, we're two of, uh, I'm sorry. We're, we're building two variants of the Columbia, uh, excuse me, of the uh, Virginia. And uh, one of the variants is up to 24 months behind, the other is 36 months behind. So we are not just failing to build in terms of planning, we are way behind right now where we should be. And I think that those numbers are a measure of the crisis that we face in submarine construction, which is essential to our undersea superiority, which is in turn essential to our Navy's strength and our defense. Um, I am really at a loss for why we are planning on failure. And this is not personal because I know the bed was on fire when you got into it. You're not, you know, responsible for a lot of these delays, but all of us are responsible right now for a, a failure to invest if we, in fact, fail. The American public has no idea about this situation. My guess is that um, the numbers of people who really are familiar with it could fit on the floor of the United States Senate. But they're going to learn about it when that failure becomes apparent with the threats to us abroad. Uh, and it's not just the production capacity electric boat uh, or in Virginia. There are literally, for every one of those submarines, 16,000 suppliers. 16,000 suppliers for whom the demand signals are, we ain't doing it anymore. In effect, go put your workforce on something else or disband your workforce. So it's not just the 5,300 people that Electric Boat has to hire, it's also the workforce for those 16,000 suppliers. And I, I would just repeat the, the request from Senator Sullivan, tell us what you need, not what the budget is. The budget I recognize is not your doing solely, but whether it's in a classified setting or in some other setting, give us what you need 
and then it'll be on us to, to meet those needs. Senator, I'd be happy to engage in that conversation. I will have to say that um, the, the problem is pervasive, it's, it's deep, and it's broad. Um, where our estimates is they're just for getting to two and a third plus, uh, Virginia's plus one Columbia, we're going to need up to 10,000 more uh, people, not just tradescraft, but also engineers and the other uh, elements of support for the people on the waterfront doing that work. We have a big lift in front of us, and we are gearing up for it. We're using the supplemental to engage with industry and create those trained people. It's, it's going to be a long, uh, hard run, I'm, but I'm, I'm really going to I'm going to interrupt, uh, and I apologize, but it can't be long. It may be hard, but long is not acceptable because long is in effect saying we can't do this in the time that we need to do it. Thank you for that and correction. I, I want to second uh, the point that my colleague Senator King made. Um, I recently visited um, a, our base in Jordan, the joint base that we have with the Jordanians, and I heard a briefing on the Tower 22 drone attack, which is frightening, not just because we lost three of our troops there, but because the drones that were used there essentially are going to be the wave of the future. They're cheap, they're low-flying, they're slow, they fly at about the rate of a car, and they're unstoppable if they come at us in swarms right now with what we have. This technology is a matter of keeping our men and women alive when we put them out in those locations with the asymmetric warfare they have right now. We're, we're trying to combat them with uh, missiles that cost millions of dollars. We don't have enough of them, and then they're they're not as effective as we need to be against them. So um, I'll follow up on this line of questioning as well. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. You bet. Thank you. Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for your uh, testimony here today and your uh, service uh, to our country. I want to follow up on uh, the, some of the questions related to the submarine program and uh, the industrial base. Um, um, and, and Senator Sullivan talking about, and my colleagues talking about what more do you need. Um, however, it seems as if you do have a lot of money been appropriated for this. So it's not a lack of cash, but you just can't keep throwing money out there and not doing things uh, differently. In fact, I think Congress has allocated about $3.3 billion in the recent National Security Supplemental to support the submarine industrial base. So there are plenty of resources there, and I would argue that there are a lot of suppliers out there that do have the capacity and do have the workforce. I speak from our industry and our industrial base in the state of Michigan. Uh, one thing we do in Michigan is we know how to make things. We're a major manufacturing uh, state, and precision manufacturing is uh, what folks do day in and day out. Highly skilled uh, union workforce uh, is available there. And I know we have a number of suppliers that currently provide material uh, for the submarine program. So my question for you, uh, Secretary Garden, is that to what extent are you looking at existing industrial suppliers that are able to provide immediate capacity to be able to shorten this, this time lag that you have with the submarine programs. Certainly, I'd want to work with you in Michigan, but to what extent are you looking at a very well-developed and mature supply, industrial supply base in Michigan to help solve the problems that you're dealing with? Thank you, Senator. It's amazing opportunities that we have for pushing work out of the waterfront activities where we have these major shipyards into other places that can build large sections or even smaller pieces that make up this overall thing we call, in this particular case, a submarine. Uh, the focus factory effort that we're doing with our major suppliers to uh, push out things like building whole decks or doing pre-assembly of things so they can be brought to the shipyards to be installed to move as much of that work out of the unique place by the water that, uh, ha that where we have to actually build the submarine. But very interested in moving as much industrial activity out of those very dense places into areas, other places, other states where that work can be done effectively. And you're familiar with some of Michigan's capabilities, our suppliers that are there who, who do this kind of work day in and day out, not just for the automotive industry, but uh, actually a very uh, growing and robust aerospace industry uh, in Michigan and certainly naval 
construction. Uh, in fact, we have a major uh, school that uh, trains naval engineers at the University of Michigan, so very, very well prepared. You are familiar with all of that. Uh, I'm learning more about Michigan's opportunities and, and other opportunities in other states as well. Um, the University of Michigan is a particular important place for me because that's a place where we get a lot of our naval architects. Right. But we, we actually do need to share that joy and get more people into that business. Right. And, and as well as advanced degrees besides, which I think University of Michigan may be the unique place where we get a master's and PhDs in naval right. architecture. Actually, it's bachelor's, master's, and PhDs, the only uh, Reach our uh, top uh, tier research university that does that. So uh, could, could you, uh, Mr. Secretary, could, you, could the Navy provide me with a detailed accounting of the current Michigan submarine uh, industrial base suppliers and future submarine suppliers uh, needs? Is that something that's available that you could provide to me? Um, I'm not going to be able to give that to you immediately because I might miss something and I don't want to get anything wrong. I'd be happy to take that for the record. I think it's going to be really important. I think it's important for us to fully understand that and understand how we can help solve that problem. We're all about solving that problem. So if you could provide that for me and a commitment to work with me to try to figure out how we uh, allow the Michigan uh, industrial base to help solve this problem by making world-class products for you. Uh, happy to make that commitment and any other state as well. Uh, Secretary, uh, you, you um, in your 45-day uh, ship uh, building review, you identified uh, a lot of the ship uh, building delays and some of the things that you've talked about today. But as part of uh, the review, it's not just submarines. Uh, you also uh, highlighted delays to the Navy's new Constellation uh, class uh, frigates. A um, couple of questions. What, what, what responsibility does the Navy share for the delays to the frigate program in particular? Um, Senator, it's a particularly troubling conversation uh, because there were opportunities where we um, uh, could have kept a better eye on the shop, to be perfectly frank. Um, we did not uh, do sufficient oversight uh, prior to my arrival. However, um, what that 45-day study illuminated were some of the um, problems we were having relative to engaging with that company to make sure that they were doing the job necessary to perform with excellence. We have moved uh, hard into that area. I have got a bunch of people now from both the program executive officer as well as Naval Sea Systems Command rotating through um, uh, Marinette to provide the additional uh, intellectual resources to get into a better place, as well as making sure they have other contract support work from um, other naval architecture firms. Well, uh, I'm out of time, but I'd love to have further discussion with you about that as to how we solve that problem as well, which is uh, critical. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Peters. Senator Shaheen, up next. Thank you all for being here. Um, I would like to follow up on some of these questions, but I have a good news story that I want to share with you, Secretary Gurton, as we're talking about the challenges the Navy faces. I want to thank you for the recent establishment of the Accelerated Welding Program in New Hampshire. It's a partnership between Senedia, Granite State Manufacturing, and the Manchester Community College, and um, it's working very well. So it's going to help as we look at the what we need to do to get those 100,000 new workers that we need. Um, for submarine production. But I want to better understand, Secretary Gurton, some of the things that you said. When you talked about the utilization of our ships, is the issue that they aren't ready to, they're not seaworthy to go out? Is it that we don't have enough operating funds to put them, to deploy them out on a and the basis on which we need to do that? What's, what's the issue with the utilization? I'm, I'm sorry, Senator, I may have misspoke. Um, uh, maybe Admiral Pitts would like to jump in and about what it takes to make our ships more uh, ready to go to sea and keep them at sea longer. Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, in big picture, we have a, a tiered readiness system where a, a ship goes through a maintenance period, then it goes through basic training, integrated training, and then it's ready to deploy. And we deploy based on how the Secretary of Defense tells us to allocate to the COCOMs and deploy through our global force management. So we may have some ships that are, are not deployed, but they're still doing training or in earlier phases of the full readiness for deployed operations. 
Now, the fair point is, is we still, as we're well aware, have some struggles right now of getting our ships through the maintenance, and that's one of the CNO's highest priorities, to get more players on the field, to get a, improve our maintenance performance so that we can get them in and out of maintenance and get them operational again. Okay, so with respect to maintenance, Senator King and I share the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard where they have a very good record of maintenance. Um, I think they are continue to be on time and under budget, or at least on budget. Um, and we have a significant investment in the shipyard infrastructure optimization plan. Are you saying that once we have completed the PSYOP in the four public shipyards that we still are not gonna have the capacity that we need to um, get the maintenance done on our ships to keep them out at sea? So I'd like to take a first stab at that one. Admiral Pitts, you can join in. Um, by the way, as a formal Portsmouth Naval Shipyard um, Navy reservist, a uh, big fan of the work going on there. I was up there uh, not too long ago and seeing the new dry dock coming together and all the waterfront support facilities were really helping to change how they will do that work now and into the future so that we can do the repair and maintenance of these, especially submarines up there, uh, faster and better as a continuum. This is something we're gonna to have to continue to invest on. We kind of left that alone for a little too long and now we're making these big investments now so that we can improve our public shipyard's ability to do this work for the nation. I understand that. The question that I'm asking, maybe I wasn't clear, is that once we have, according to our PSYOP plan, we're gonna make these investments and at the end of that, are you saying that we're not still not going to have the capacity we need to do the maintenance on um, the ships that are being maintained at those public shipyards? Is that the, uh, one of the, the issues? Uh, the, the PSYOP plan uh, reaches a crescendo, but I think as we get to the further out in years, we're going to want to continue to invest and keep that edge sharp so we can always do this work better and faster as a long-term proposition. Okay, I'm still trying to get to what, what you were talking about when you were talking about needing more capacity. Do we need more capacity to build new ships? Do we need more maintenance capacity? Do we need both? And what's the plan to get there? Because I, I still am not sure that I understand how we're gonna do that. Um, both is good uh, in terms of building and um, maintaining. Um, in terms of uh, specific capacity challenges, uh, so the magic wand uh, ch challenge that Senator Sumlin gave us, I'd, I'd like to come back to the uh, subcommittee and give you a more detailed, thorough understanding of what we could possibly be do doing different in the future. You didn't answer my question, I gotta say. I appreciate that there was an effort to do that, but I, I, I don't feel like we have an answer to what we need to do as members of Congress to support the work that the Navy's doing to get us to where we need to be on the fleet that we need. So I, I will leave it at that, Mr. Chairman. We're gonna have a second round of questions. General Heck, I'm gonna start with you. Um, and it's an end of pay time. Reality that congested logistics is going to be a significant challenge in the Indo-PACOM. And Indo-PACOM, Transcom, some, some better than Crowley, but the Marine Corps logistical issues. So how within the force design and the Marine Corps planning are you working to provide options to commanders to support logistics for stand-in forces who are within an adversary's uh, weapons engagement zone. Sir, thanks, and uh, I was enjoying the show, so don't feel obligation to ask me a question, sir. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, sir, I'll, I'll just say, uh, you know, we've we've gotten after this from the beginning with Global Positioning Network, which is rethinking everything from maritime prepositioning to, uh, you know, because the 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 the, the Conclusion, the assumptions we made before about our force was that we'd be able to dump an Iron Mountain somewhere and they would be okay. That's never going to happen again. Never going to happen. To, to Senator King's point about hypersonics, right? We, we, so we have to rethink everything. So the way we approach this is in uh, a multi-tiered. We do have a Marine Corps concept for 
logistics in a contested environment, we've gotten after that as well. And as you know, we have fielded two prototypes of autonomous, autonomous low-profile vessels, semi-submersible narco sub that's almost impossible to track. We prioritized our focus of logistics. I told my staff, focus on lethality, right? Good allies and partners, I met with the Commandant of the Philippine Marine Corps today. Our relationship is getting tighter and tighter every day. Our allies and partners are going to be there for us in a lot of ways. You know, uh, chow, you know, other things. The, the, the discussion becomes a little more testy when you start talking about lethality, things that we can launch. And so we're focused on lethality. So the ALPV, the Autonomous Low Profile Vessel, is form fit function for two naval strike missiles to get those to resupply points in, inside the weapons engagement zone of, of our pacing adversary. So I think we're moving out on this, sir. And, you know, and as you know, we've chartered a couple of vessels, stern landing vessels. One's about to move forward to the First Island Chain with the 3rd Marine Littoral Regiment. And we're going to start experimenting with it uh, now. And we'll iterate and make adjustments to where we're going. Let me ask you a follow-up. Um, I, I want to ask about a UAS question, Indo-PACOM or any of the Marine Corps. How are you working to counter the prevalence of UAS's defending but also to incorporate UASs into your own well, sir, so uh, to your point about logistics, one of the U U yeah, UASs we've already fielded is the TRUAS, the Tactical Resupply um, uh, Unmanned Aerial uh, System. And it's, we're, it's, it doesn't do heavy payloads, but think chow, water, uh, parts. Uh, and, it, and it has the range to do it within, uh, within the first island chain, uh, the, the range we need. Um, as far as countering, as you know, we've already fielded the Marine Air Defense Integrated System, Mattis and El Mattis which is a little bit better on the, you know, the cost curve, right? Fielded with things like Stinger, mm -hmm. um, and it uses a 30 millimeter cannon. Um, and now, the swarming part that the Senator King is talking about, we, you know, I, I think technology is catching up. I actually had a discussion with a couple of industry partners today at Modern Day Marine about where we're, because I specifically asked that question about swarming technology. Probably not gonna be lasers, not point defense, but when you talk about large mass swarming, um, you need things like high, high energy microwave, right? They can just drop masses of them at one time. And I'm going to tell you, sir, I'm confident, 100% confident that, that technology is going to catch up to that, and we will field those, and we will get on the right side of the cost curve. Until then, we'll keep pursuing other things, like we're looking at APKWS, you know, Advanced Precision Kill Weapon System, a 2.75 rocket, uh, much more affordable than SM6 and SM2s and, and Evolved Sea Sparrow missiles. Um, Secretary Gardner, uh, Senator, Peters asked you, Senator Peters asked you about the, uh, uh, the frigate and the challenges with that. You said something to me in the office yesterday that I would like my colleagues to hear, which is that part of the problem with the frigate was the way we contracted <coughs> for it. It's great to do a fixed price contract. That's great for predictability. But if you do it on the first in class, and then the first in class has a lot of changes, you pretty much guarantee that that contract you give below, which, which looks good up front, may not be such a big contract. Could you share that, that insight? So one of the things that I've asked my team to do uh, as a result of the 45-day study is to examine the way we balance risk with industry, the way we manage our incentives and the way we structure those kinds of contracts to make sure that we're utilizing the right tool at the right time. And that's uh, it's an example of perhaps not using the right tool at the right time. I think that at this point, I'd have to say it's the only bad example we have of vi big structure in terms of um, um, you know, using fixed price in one place and cost plus in another. But one of the things, other things that came up through that study is uh, whether or not we're using the right balance of incentives and whether or not these publicly traded companies and uh, how we reach to them and motivate their behaviors through the uh, structure of profit, um, we're going to take a fresh look at that and see if we can, first of all, do that better uh, risk balancing between government and industry, and also make sure that our incentives are effective. And then before I hand it to Senator Kramer, the other thing about the, the frigate is, if you go into it with a plan that, okay, here's a platform that exists and will basically replicate 85% of the existing platform and 15% of the new, by the end of the design, it's 15% existing and 85% new, then you're going to have some challenges getting getting the job done. And I know that's a lesson from that as well. Senator Kramer. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to ask one sort of open-ended question about the budget from a different angle. I, I mean, I get if, 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 if we could, you could have more, you want more capacity, and um, we're struggling to understand what that is. But if we're stuck with this flat budget or really inflationary, you know, inflation-adjusted negative, you know, 
cut, a budget cut. What areas of this budget assume the most risk in your mind? If we're stuck with what's been presented, what areas represent the, the greatest risk? And I, each of you could answer that. <coughs> I don't know, Admiral, do you want to take first crack at that one? Start? Oh yeah, please oh, do. Oh, yep. okay. So, so I'll just say for the Marine Corps, we've you know we've we've been aggressively modernizing, and we're very very happy with where we are with force design. And notice we don't call it 2030 anymore; it's never going to end. Um, but now our Barracks 2030 initiative, which is the com one of the Commandant's top priorities. So with this kind of budget, that pressurization on top, where I will take risks, sir, is in my my war uh, enterprise planning team. So it's it's modernization. So we will we will we will be forced to slow modernization. Senator, uh, we think the priorities as laid out by the CNO and the SECNAV were the right priorities given the resources that we had allocated. Where we took risk is in our future fleet. Uh, some of our what we we have the fleet in being. We're going to modernize the fleet that we have. Where we took risk is are those follow-on platforms to to replace some of our legacy things, such as SSNX delaying procurement, Air Wing of the future. We have some risks there. Um, so I, I like both those answers. Actually, I think that in terms of on the acquisition side, where we took risk is. Um, Understanding what um, the outcome of the 45-day study and the realities of um, uh, higher uh, challenges with respect to labor as well as the supply chain. The supply chain is fundamentally changed. Right? It's just going to be longer. It's going to take longer to get more stuff. Um, in an inflation-capped uh, environment, uh, that's going to be very challenging for us in terms of making sure we get product put out the door in the time we need to. Uh, nothing further. Thank you. Senator King. <clears throat> uh, yes. Uh, early in April, I requested the, the Pentagon to give, give me background on the uh, directed energy budget. And I have an unclassified report, which we got yesterday, which I'd like to just uh, submit for the record of the committee. Without objection. It's pretty sad, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but there it is. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really have any follow-ups, except, uh, General, I, I agree with you. said... You, I said that you said the technology is going to catch up with the risk. It ain't going to catch up with the risk if we don't fund it. If we don't do the, the research, the, the prototyping, and the development, uh, it, it, it won't work without the investment. And that's the point I'm making. And I, I, uh, I came into this meeting with a cold, and you managed to help me clear my sinuses earlier, and I appreciate that. But, but seriously, uh, I hope you'll go back and think about directed energy because it just makes so much sense. And uh, it, it's a place where uh, the cost, the the cost benefit is is overwhelming. Uh, a, a shot from a high-powered laser is about I think 25 cents instead of four million. Uh, and uh, on on the other thing is about I, I agree shipbuilding all in. We need more ships, but we also need to utilize the ships we have better. And I. I hope that, that you would, and, and by the way, the same criticism goes for the Air Force. If they were sitting here, they'd be getting a load of this too. Um, these are expensive assets, and we should be using them more efficiently. When the private sector invests in a capital asset, they use it. Those mills are open 24 hours a day. And uh, so it would seem to me that it would be cost effective to really study maintenance patterns using AI to predict uh, maintenance, what could be done on ship. For example, I think every ship should have a 3D printer, so you don't have to bring it into a dry dock to get a part. Uh, so I think, I, I hope that this is an area where you would really do some study because 25% uh, utilization of these very valuable capital assets is, is just unacceptable. So I appreciate your testimony here today, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your holding this hearing. Thank you. So I have two more items that I uh, would like to ask about. So, um, and they're both related to AUKUS. So I'm going to go AUKUS Pillar Two, then AUKUS Pillar One. So, AUKUS Pillar Two, talk about. We're very familiar with Pillar One. Pillar Two is more open-ended. So I'm curious how both the Navy and the Marines are thinking about AUKUS Pillar Two and our engagement with Australia and the UK. Just give us a little status report. 
Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, we are fully committed to AUKUS Pillar 2. Uh, we work very closely with our Australian and, and uh, UK counterparts in every domain that is under underneath my charge, air, surface, undersea, science and technology, uh, and digital warfare. Uh, we have efforts moving along the technology areas that are called out for AUKUS Pillar 2, whether that's hypersonics, undersea capabilities, AI, ML, and uh, it's a very strong relationship and uh, we, we are uh, charging out there to help make us all stronger. General Huckle. Sir, I don't know that, uh, there's, that the Marine Corps has much in Pillar 2, but I, I failed in our office call the other day to, to mention on Pillar we're actually doing uh, in the in the vein of the stern landing vessel. You know, we've done mm -hmm. we've gone to industry and chartered ships. Hornbeck Offshore is the first one that will soon be heading out to the first island chain. We're doing a foreign comparative test with the with Australia Sea Transport. It's going to be a cooperative operating agreement between the two countries, and we're super excited about it, sir, because the Australians specifically nothing with the UK other than we like getting on their boats and flying fifth gen fighters off of them. But the, for the Australians, so there's a, there's a lot of promise there, and they they know the theater better than yeah. most. So excited about that. But from Pillar Two, sir, I think our equities are, are minimal. Um, let me ask now back on a, a Pillar One question, although it's a little bit broader. So, Secretary Garden, I'm going to put you on the spot on this one. Um, we got to get to two plus one, Virginia plus one, Columbia, and then we got to get to two point three plus one to meet the commitments that we've made in the AUKUS framework. Based on the investments we've made based upon the investments that we have committed now in the SUP, based upon the investments the Aussies have made, based upon the 25 budgetary uh, requests, based upon what's in the fit up for the submarine industrial base, when should we get to two plus one? And when should we get to 2.3 plus one? I'm going to give you a couple of dates, but uh, if, if I get it wrong, uh, permit me to catch up with yep. you. Um, I believe we'll get to uh, two Virginias uh, by 28, and I think it's 32 that we get to um, two and a third. I see Admiral Pitts sort of nodding yes. Is that generally your understanding as well? That's the general understanding, yes, sir. So two by 28 and 2.3 by 32, and the commitment that we've made to the Aussies is to sell them three to five Virginia class subs in the decade of the 30s. So if you, if you get to 2.3, by 32, then let's see, 0.3 times 9 is 2.7. And so you're, you're, you're kind of maybe not quite getting to 3 in the 30s that you would be able to sell. I mean, obviously that pace, um, and, and they want to buy at least 3. They said they buy, might buy up to 5. And look, I think some of the, the pillar one is still kind of kind of open ended in the sense of if they start buying the Virginia class and they really like them and they're interoperable and they learn how to maintain and operate them and in, in, in an interoperable way with us, there might be a decision down the road like we'll just keep buying Virginia class and working on that together rather than build a, a different design that's off a kind of a UK framework even though there would be a lot of US technology in it. But I'm. But if if am I wrong to do the math that way? If we're doing 2.3 by 32, we're not going to be able to sell them three in the 2030s. I think the first two are actually existing Virginias, and we're so, going to backfit our. We're going to plus up ours in the future. So I, I think we can get to three, even to five, by the end of the 30s. Well, 28, that, 28's not far off. I mean, you know, to try to get to two by 28, because what are we at now? Like 1.3. We are investing mightily, sir, as you mentioned, yeah. in improving our ability to do this business. And, and then uh, when are we going to get to one a year, Columbia? Well, we're committed to serial production starting in the third boat. And mm -hmm. that, that's where we have to start one a year. And to be, I, I am confident we will get there, but we're going to have to run fast to get to it. Yep. Well, I think that seems to be a theme of the hearing. We're going to have to run fast to do what we've said we're going to do, and we need to both provide you the resources to run fast, but we also, you know, again, on the workforce issues, I, I just worry that some of our issues, you know, cannibalize one workforce to meet another or one region's to help another. We're not necessarily growing the net, and we've got a declining birth rate as, as a nation, and we've got an economy that's pretty hot right now where people have a lot of competition for other jobs, and I don't see that necessarily changing. So, I mean, I appreciate, was it the Academy Awards? 
Yeah, I mean, when I see an ad for the submarine industrial base during the Academy Awards, that's different. That that's that's showing like, hey, we really are reaching out in a non-traditional way. But we're going to have to do a lot in the non-traditional space, I think, if we're going to have the workforce to meet the kind of dates that you are um, stating before the committee. So it's been a good hearing. We appreciate your service. We appreciate you being here. Um, I will uh, offer to my colleagues the chance to submit questions for the record by the close of business tomorrow. And if they are submitted, um, you know, I hope that you will be both prompt and um, comprehensive in your response. With that, the committee, subcommittee adjourns.